Chapter thirty six of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, BC. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. The Nose Tree did you ever hear the story of the three poor soldiers who after having fought hard in the wars set out on their road home begging their way as they went they had journeyed a long time sick at heart with their bad luck at thus being turned loose on the world in their old days when one evening they reached a deep gloomy wood through which lay their road night came fast upon them and they found that they must however unwilling sleep in the wood so to make all safe as they could it was agreed that two should lie down and sleep while a third sat up and watched lest wild beasts should break in and tear them to pieces when he was tired he was to wake one of the others and sleep his turn and so on with the third so as to share the work fairly among them the two who were to rest first soon lay down and fell fast asleep and the other made himself a good fire under the trees and sat down by its side to keep watch he had not sat long before all of a sudden up came a little dwarf in a red jacket who is there said he a friend said the soldier what sort of a friend an old broken soldier said the other with his two comrades who have nothing left to live on come sit down and warm yourself well my worthy fellow said the little man i will do what i can for you take this and show it to your comrades in the morning so he took out an old cloak and gave it to the soldier telling him that whenever he put it over his shoulders anything that he wished for would be done for him then the little man made him a bow and walked away the second soldier's turn to watch soon came and the first laid him down to sleep but the second man had not sat by himself long before up came the dwarf in the red jacket again the soldier treated him in as friendly a way as his comrade had done and the little man gave him a purse which he told him would be always full of gold let him draw as much as he would out of it then the third soldier's turn to watch came and he also had a little red jacket for his guest who gave him a wonderful horn that drew crowds around it whenever it was played and made every one forget his business to come and dance to its beautiful music in the morning each told his story and showed the gift he had got from the elf and as they all liked one another very much and were old friends they agreed to travel together to see the world and for a while only to make use of the wonderful purse and thus they spent their time very joyously till at last they began to be tired of this roving life and thought they should like to have a home of their own so the first soldier put his old cloak on and wished for a fine castle in a moment it stood before their eyes fine gardens and green lawns spread around it and flocks of sheep and goats herds of oxen were grazing about and out of the gate came a grand coach with three dapple gray horses to meet them and bring them home all this was very well for a time but they found it would not do to stay at home always so they got together all their rich clothes and jewels and money and ordered their coach with three dapple gray horses and sent out on a journey to see a neighboring king now this king had only a daughter and as he saw the three soldiers traveling in such grand style he took them for king's sons 
and so gave him a kind welcome one day as the second soldier was walking with the princess she saw that he had the wonderful purse in his hand then she asked him what it was and he was foolish enough to tell her though indeed it did not much signify what he said for she was a fairy and knew all the wonderful things that the three soldiers had brought now this princess was very cunning and artful so she set to work and made a purse so like the soldiers that no one would know the one from the other and then she asked him to come and see her and made him drink some wine that she had got ready for him and which soon made him fall fast asleep then she felt in his pocket and took away the wonderful purse and left the one she had made in its place the next morning the soldiers set out home and soon after they reached their castle happening to want some money they went to their purse for it and found nothing indeed in it but to their great sorrow when they had emptied it none came in the place of what they took then the cheat was soon found out for the second soldier knew where he had been and how he had told the story to the princess and he guessed that she had played him a trick alas cried he poor wretches that we are what shall we do oh said the first soldier let no gray hairs grow for this mishap i will soon get the purse back so he threw his cloak across his shoulders and wished himself in the princess's chamber there he found her sitting alone telling up her gold that fell around her in a shower from the wonderful purse but the soldier stood looking at her too long for she turned around and the moment she saw him she started up and cried out with all her force thieves thieves so that the whole court came running in and tried to seize him the poor soldier now began to be dreadfully frightened in his turn and thought it was high time to make the best of his way off so without thinking of the ready way of travelling that his cloak gave him he ran to the window opened it and jumped out and unluckily in his haste his cloak caught and was left hanging to the great joy of the princess who knew its worth the poor soldier made the best of his way home to his comrades on foot and in a very downcast mood but the third soldier told him to keep up his heart and took his horn and blew a merry tune at the first blast a countless host of foot and horse came rushing to their aid and they set out to make war against their enemy the king's palace was at once besieged and he was told that he must give up the purse and cloak or that not one stone shall be left upon another so the king went into his daughter's chamber and talked with her but she said let me try first if i cannot beat them one way or another so she thought of a cunning scheme to overreach them and dressing herself out as a poor girl with a basket on her arm she set out by night with her maid and went into the enemy's camp as if she wanted to sell trinkets in the morning she began to ramble about singing ballads so beautifully that all the tents were left empty and the soldiers ran round in crowds and thought of nothing but hearing her sing among the rest came the soldier to whom the horn belonged and as soon as she saw him she winked to her maid who slipped slyly through the crowd and went into his tent where it hung and stole it away this done they both got safely back to the palace the besieging army went away the three wonderful gifts were all left in the hands of the princess and the three soldiers were penniless and forlorn as when little red jacket found them in the wood poor fellows they began to think what was now to be done comrades at last said the second soldier who had 
had the purse we had better part we cannot live together let each seek his bread as well as he can so he turned to the right and the other two went to the left for they said they would rather travel together the second soldier strayed on till he came to a wood which happened to be the same wood where they had met with so much good luck before and he walked on a long time till evening began to fall when he sat down tired beneath a tree and soon fell asleep morning dawned and he was greatly delighted on opening his eyes to see that the tree was laden with the most beautiful apples he was hungry enough so he soon plucked and ate the first one then a second then a third apple a strange feeling came over his nose when he put the apple to his mouth something was in the way he felt it it was his nose that grew and grew till it hung down to his breast it did not stop there still it grew and grew heavens thought he when will it have done growing and well might he ask for by this time it reached the ground as he sat on the grass and thus it kept creeping on till he could not bear its weight or raise himself up and it seemed as if it would never end for already it stretched its enormous length all through the wood over the hill and dale meantime his comrades were journeying on till on a sudden one of them stumbled against something what can that be said the other they looked and could think of nothing that it was like but a nose we will follow it and find its owner however said they so they traced it up till at last they found their poor comrade lying stretched along under the apple tree what was to be done they tried to carry him but in vain they caught an ass that was passing and raised him up on its back but it was soon tired of carrying such a load so they sat down in despair when before long came up their old acquaintance the dwarf with the red jacket well how now friend said he laughing well i must find a cure for you i see so he told them to gather a pear from another tree that grew close by and the nose would come right again no time was lost and the nose to the poor soldier's joy was soon brought to its proper size i will do something more for you still said the dwarf take some of those pears and apples with you whoever eats one of the apples will have its nose grow like yours just now but if you give him a pear all will come right again go to the princess and get her to eat some of your apples her nose will grow twenty times as long as yours did then look sharp and you will get what you want from her the friends thanked the dwarf very heartily for all his kindness and it was agreed that the poor soldier who had already tried the power of the apple should follow out the suggestion so he dressed himself up as a gardener's boy and went to the king's palace and said he had apples to sell so fine and so beautiful as were never seen be there before every one that saw them was delighted and wanted to taste but he said they were for the princess only and she should send her maid to buy his stock they were so ripe and rosy that she soon began eating and had not eaten above a dozen before she too began to wonder what ailed her nose for it grew and grew down to the ground out at the window over the garden and away nobody knows where then the king made known to all his kingdom that whoever would heal her of this dreadful disease should be richly rewarded many tried but the princess got no relief and now the old soldier dressed himself up very sprucely as a doctor and said he would cure her so he chopped up some of the apple 
and to punish her a little more gave her a dose saying he would call to-morrow and see her again the morrow came and of course instead of being better the nose had been growing on all night as before and the poor princess was in a dreadful fright so the doctor then chopped up a very little of the pear and gave her and said he was sure that would do good and he would call again the next day the next day came and the nose was to be sure a little smaller but yet it was bigger than when the doctor first began to meddle with it then he thought to himself i must frighten this cunning princess a little more before i shall get what i want from her so he gave her another dose of the apple and said he would call on the morrow the morrow came and the nose was ten times as bad as before my good lady said the doctor something works against my medicine and it is too strong for it but i know by the force of my art what it is you have stolen goods about you i am sure and if you do not give them back i can do nothing for you but the princess denied very stoutly that she had anything of the kind very well said the doctor you may do as you please but i am sure i am right and you will die if you do not own it then he went to the king and told him how the matter stood daughter said he send back the cloak the purse and the horn that you stole from the right owners then she ordered her maid to fetch all three and gave them to the doctor and begged him to give them back to the soldiers and the moment he had them safe he gave her a whole pear to eat and the nose came right and as for the doctor he put on the cloak wished the king and all his court a good day and was soon with his two friends who lived from that time happily at home in their palace except when they took an airing to see the world in their coach with the three dapple gray horses End of chapter thirty six recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, BC. Chapter thirty seven of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c tales of laughter by nora archibald smith and kate douglas wiggin the adventures of chancellor and partlet one how they went to the hills to eat nuts chancellor said to partlet one day the nuts must be ripe now we will go up the hill together and have a good feast before the squirrel carries them all off all right said partlet come along we'll have a fine time so they went away up the hill and as it was a bright day they stayed till evening now whether they really had grown fat or whether it was merely pride i do not know but whatever the reason they would not walk home and chancellor had to make a little carriage of nutshells when it was ready partlet took her seat in it and said to chancellor now you go between the shafts that's all very fine said chancellor but i would sooner go home on foot than put myself in harness I will sit on the box and drive but draw it myself i never will and they were squabbling over this a duck quacked out you thievish folk who told you to come to my nut hill just you wait you will suffer for it then she rushed at chancellor with open bill but he was not to be taken by surprise and fell upon her with his spurs till she cried out for grace 
At last she allowed herself to be harnessed to the carriage. Chanticleer seated himself on the box as coachman and cried out unceasingly, Now, duck, run as fast as you can. When they had driven a little way, they met two foot passengers, a pin and a needle, who called out, Stop, stop. They said it would soon be pitch dark and they couldn't walk a step farther. The road was so dirty, might they not have a lift? They had been to the tailor's inn by the gate and had lingered over their beer. As they were both very thin and did not take up much room, Chancellor allowed them to get in, but he made them promise not to tread either on his toes or on partlets. Late in the evening they came to an inn, and as they did not want to drive any farther in the dark, and the duck was getting rather uncertain on her feet, tumbling from side to side, they drove in. The landlord at first made many objections to having them, and said the house was already full. Perhaps he thought they were not very grand folk. But at last, by dint of persuasive words and promising him the egg which Mrs. Partlet had laid on the way, and also that he should keep the duck, who laid an egg every day, he consented to let them stay the night. Then they had a meal served to them, and feasted and passed the time in rioting. In the early dawn, before it grew light and every one was asleep, Partlet woke up Chancellor, fetched the egg, pecked a hole in it, and between them they ate it all up, and threw the shells on to the hearth. Then they went to the needle, which was still asleep, seized it by the head, and stuck it in the cushion of the landlord's armchair. The pin they stuck in the towel, and then, without more ado, away they flew over the heath. The duck, who preferred to sleep in the open air and had stayed in the yard, heard them whizzing by and bestirred herself. She found a stream and swam away down it. It was much quicker way to get on than being harnessed to a carriage. A couple of hours later, the landlord, who was the first to leave his pillow, got up and washed. When he took up the towel to dry himself, he scratched his face and made a long red line from ear to ear. Then he went to the kitchen to light his pipe. But when he stooped over the hearth, the eggshells flew into his eye. Everything goes to my head this morning, he said angrily, as he dropped on to the cushion of his grandfather's armchair, but he quickly bounded up again and shouted, Gracious me! for the needle had run into him, and this time not in the head. He grew furious, and his suspicions immediately fell on the guests who had come in so late the night before. When he went to look for them, they were nowhere to be seen. Then he swore never to take such rag muffins into his house again, for they ate a great deal, paid nothing, and played tricks, by way of thanks, into the bargain. 2. The Visit to Mr. Corbs Another day, when Partlet and Chancellor were about to take a journey, Chancellor built a fine carriage with four red wheels and harnessed four little mice to it. Mrs. Partlet seated herself in it with Chancellor, and they drove off together. Before long they met a cat, who said, Whither way? Chancellor answered, All on our way, all on our way, a visit to pay to Mr. Corbs at home today. Take me with you, said the cat. Chancellor answered, With pleasure, sit down behind, so that you don't fall out forward. When we're off, away we roam, to visit Mr. Corbs at home. My wheel's so red, pray have a care, from any splash of mud to spare. 
Ye wheels sweep on with speed inclined, Ye mice outstrip the whistling wind, When we're off, away to roam, To visit Mr. Corbs at home. Then came a milestone, an egg, a duck, a pin, And last of all, a needle. They all took their places in the carriage And went with the rest. But when they arrived at Mr. Corbs' house, He wasn't in. The mice drew the carriage into the coach house. Partlet and Chancellor flew onto a perch. The cat sat down by the fire. The duck lay down by the well pole. The egg rolled itself up in the towel. The pin stuck itself into the cushion. The needle sprang into the pillow on the bed, and the millstone laid itself over the door. When Mr. Corbs came home, and went to the hearth to make a fire the cat threw ashes into his eyes he ran into the kitchen to wash and the duck squirted water into his face seizing the towel to dry himself the egg rolled out broke and stuck up one of his eyes he wanted to rest and sat down in his armchair when the pin pricked him he grew very angry threw himself on the bed and laid his head on the pillow when the needle ran into him and made him cry out in a fury he wanted to rush into the open air but when he got to the door the millstone fell on his head and killed him what a bad man mr corbs must have been three the death of parlet Parlet and Chancelier went to the Nut Hill on another occasion, and they arranged that whichever of them found a nut should share it with the other. Parlet found a huge nut, but said nothing about it, and meant to eat it all herself, but the kernel was so big that she could not swallow it. It stuck in her throat, and she was afraid she would be choked she shrieked chancellor chancellor run and fetch some water as fast as you can or i shall choke so chancellor ran as fast as he could to the well and said well well you must give me some water parlet is out on the nut hill she has swallowed a big nut and is choking the well answered first you must run to my bride and tell her to give you some red silk chancellor ran to the bride and said bride bride give me some red silk i will give the silk to the well and the well will give me some water to take to parlette for she has swallowed a big nut and is choking the bride answered run first and fetch me a wreath which i left hanging on a willow so chancellor ran to the willow pulled the wreath off the branch and brought it to the bride the bride gave him the red silk which he took to the well and the well gave him the water for it then chancellor took the water to parlette but as it happened she had choked in the meantime and lay there dead and stiff chancellor's grief was so great that he cried aloud and all the animals came and consoled with him six mice built a little car to draw parlette to the grave and when the car was ready they harnessed themselves to it and drew parlette away on the way reynard the fox joined them where are you going chancellor said he i'm going to bury my wife parlette may i go with you well yes if ride you will you must jump up behind to carry weight in front my horses aren't inclined so the fox took a seat at the back and he was followed by the wolf the bear the stag the lion and all the other animals of the forest the procession went on till they came to a stream how shall we ever get over said chancellor a straw was lying by the stream and it said I will stretch myself across, and then you can pass over upon me. But when the six mice got on 
to the straw, it collapsed, and the mice fell into the water with it, and they were all drowned. So the traveler's difficulty was as great as ever. Then a coal came along and said, I'm big enough. I will lie down and you can pass over me. So the coal laid itself across the stream. But unfortunately, it just touched the water, hissed, went out, and was dead. A stone, seeing this, had pity on them, and wanting to help Chancellor, laid itself over the water. Now Chancellor drew the car himself, and he just managed to get across with Parlette. Now he wanted to pull the others over who were hanging on behind, but it was too much for him and the car fell back, and they all fell into the water and were drowned. So Chancellor was left alone with the dead hen, and he dug a grave himself and laid her in it. Then he made a mound over it, and seated himself upon it, and grieved till he died, and then they were all dead. End of chapter 37 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 38 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Evan Smith. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 38 the golden goose there was once a man who had three sons the youngest of them was called simpleton he was scorned and despised by the others and kept in the background the eldest son was going into the forest to cut wood and before he started his mother gave him a nice sweet cake and a bottle of wine to take with him so that he might not suffer from hunger or thirst in the wood he met a little old gray man who bade him good day and said Give me a bit of the cake in your pocket, and let me have a drop of your wine. I am so hungry and thirsty. But the clever son said, If I give you my cake and wine, I shan't have enough for myself. Be off with you. He left the little man standing there and went on his way. But he had not been long at work cutting down a tree before he made a false stroke and dug the axe into his own arm, and he was obliged to go home to have it bound up. Now this was no accident. It was brought about by the little gray man. The second son now had to go into the forest to cut wood, and like the eldest, his mother gave him a sweet cake and a bottle of wine. In the same way, the little gray man met him and asked for a piece of his cake and a drop of his wine. But the second son made the same sensible answer. If I give you any, I shall have less for myself. Be off, out of my way. And he went on. His punishment, however, was not long delayed. After a few blows at the tree, he hit his own leg and had to be carried home. Then Simpleton said, Let me go to the wood, father. But his father said, Your brothers have only come to harm by it. You had better leave it alone. You know nothing about it. But Simpleton begged so hard to be allowed to go that at last his father said, Well, off you go, then. You will be wiser when you have hurt yourself. His mother gave him a cake which was mixed with water only and baked in the ashes, and a bottle of sour beer. When he reached the forest, like the others, he met the little gray man, who greeted him and said, Give me a bit of your cake and a drop of your wine. I am so hungry and thirsty. Simpleton answered, I have only a cake baked in the ashes and some sour beer, but if you like such fare, we will sit down and eat it together. So they sat down. But when Simpleton pulled out his cake, it was a sweet, nice cake, and his sour beer was turned into good wine. So they ate and drank, and the little man said, As you have such a kind heart, and are willing to share your possessions, I will give you good luck. There stands an old tree. Cut it down, and you will find something at the roots. So saying, he disappeared. Simpleton cut down the tree, and when it fell, lo and behold, a goose was sitting among the roots, and its feathers were of pure gold. He picked it up, and taking it with him, went to an inn where he meant to stay the night. The landlord had three daughters, who saw the goose and were very curious as to what kind of bird it could be, and wanted to get one of its golden feathers. The eldest thought, There will soon be some opportunity for me to pull out one of the feathers, 
and when Simpleton went outside, she took hold of its wing to pluck out a feather, but her hand stuck fast and she could not get away. Soon after, the second sister came up, meaning also to pluck out one of the golden feathers, but she had hardly touched her sister when she found herself held fast. Lastly, the third one came, with the same intention, but the others screamed out, Keep away, for goodness sake, keep away. But she, not knowing why she was to keep away, thought, Why should I not be there, if they are there? So she ran up, but as soon as she touched her sisters, she had to stay hanging on to them, and they all had to pass the night like this. In the morning, Simpleton took up the goose under his arm, without noticing the three girls hanging on behind, so they had to keep running after, dodging his legs right and left. In the middle of the fields they met the parson, who, when he saw the procession, cried out, For shame, you bold girls! Why do you run after the lad like that? Do you call that proper behavior? Then he took hold of the hand of the youngest girl to pull her away, but no sooner had he touched her than he felt himself held fast, and he too had to run behind. Soon after, the sexton came up, and seeing his master, the parson, treading on the heels of the three girls, cried out in amazement, "'Hello, your reverence! Whither away so fast? Don't forget that we have a christening!' So saying, he plucked the parson by the sleeve, and soon found that he could not get away either. As this party of five, one behind the other, tramped on, two peasants came along the road, carrying their hoes. The parson called them, and asked them to set the sexton and himself free. But as soon as ever they touched the sexton, they were held fast, so now there were seven people running behind Simpleton and his goose. By and by they reached a town where a king ruled, whose only daughter was so solemn that nothing and nobody could make her laugh. So the king had proclaimed that whoever could bring her laughter should marry her. When Simpleton heard this, he took his goose with all his following before her, and when she saw these seven people running, one behind another, she burst into fits of laughter, and seemed as if she could never stop. Thereupon Simpleton asked her in marriage, but the king did not like him for a son-in-law, and he made all sorts of conditions. First, he said Simpleton must bring him a man who could drink up a cellar full of wine, then Simpleton at once thought of the little grey man, who might be able to help him, and he went out to the forest to look for him. On the very spot where the tree that he had cut down had stood, he saw a man sitting with a very sad face. Simpleton asked him what was the matter, and he answered, I am so thirsty, and I can't quench my thirst. I hate cold water, and I have already emptied a cask of wine. But what is a drop like that on a burning stone? "'Well, there I can help you,' said Simpleton. "'Come with me, and you shall soon have enough to drink and to spare.' He led him to the king's cellar, and the man set to upon the great casks, and he drank and drank till his sides ached, and by the end of the day the cellar was empty. Then again Simpleton demanded his bride. But the king was annoyed that a wretched fellow called Simpleton should have his daughter, and he made new conditions. He was now to find a man who could eat up a mountain of bread.' Simpleton did not reflect long, but went straight to the forest, and there in the self-same place sat a man tightening a strap round his body and making a very miserable face. He said, I have eaten up a whole oven full of rolls, but what is the good of that when one is as hungry as I am? I am never satisfied. I have to tighten my belt every day if I am not to die of hunger. Simpleton was delighted and said, Get up and come with me. You shall have enough to eat. Then he took him to the court, where the king had caused all the flour in the kingdom to be brought together, and a huge mountain of bread to be baked. The man from the forest sat down before it and began to eat, and at the end of the day the whole mountain had disappeared. Now for the third time Simpleton asked for his bride, but again the king tried to find an excuse, and demanded a ship which could sail on land as well as at sea. "'As soon as you can furnish it, you shall have my daughter,' he said." Simpleton went straight to the forest, and there sat the little grey man to whom he had given his cake. The little man said, I have eaten and drunk for you, and now I will give you the ship, too. I do it all because you were merciful to me. Then he gave him the ship which could sail on land as well as at sea, and when the king saw it, he could no longer withhold his daughter. 
The marriage was celebrated, and at the king's death, Simpleton inherited the kingdom and lived long and happily with his wife. End of chapter 38 Recording by Evan Smith Chapter 39 of Tales of Laughter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. The Young Giant Once upon a time there lived a husbandman who had a son, when he was born was no bigger than the length of a thumb and for many years did not grow a hair's breadth taller one morning just as the countryman was about to set out to plough his field little thumbling said father i want to go too i dare say you do said the man but you are much better at home if i took you out i should be sure to lose you thereupon thumbling fell a crying and cried so much that at length his father picked him up and put him in his pocket and set forth to his work when they reached the fields the man took his son out and set him down on the ridge of a newly turned furrow so that he might see the world around him then suddenly from over the mountains a great giant came striding towards them see son said the husbandman here is an ogre coming to fetch you away because you were naughty and cried this morning and the words had scarcely passed his lips when in two great strides the giant had reached little thumpling's side and had picked him up in his great hands and carried him away without uttering a sound the poor father stood dumb with fear for he thought he should never see his little son again the giant however treated little thumbling very kindly in his house in the woods he kept him warm in his pocket and fed him so heartily and well that thumbling became a young giant himself tall and broad at the end of two years the old giant took him out into the woods to try his strength pull up that birch tree for a staff to lean upon he said and the youth obeyed and pulled it up by the roots as if it had been mere weed the old giant still thought he should like him to be stronger so after taking great care of him for another two years they again went into the wood this time thumbling playfully uprooted a stout old oak and the old giant well pleased cried now you are a credit to me and took him back to the field where he first found him here the young giant's father happened to be just then ploughing so thumbling went up to him and said see father to what a great big man your son has grown but the peasant was afraid be off with you i don't know you he cried but really and truly father i am your son he said let me take the plough for i can guide it quite as well as you the father very unwillingly let go of the plough for he was afraid of the giant and sat down to watch then thumbling laid one hand on the plough share and straight away drove it so deep into the ground that the peasant cried now you will do more harm than good if you drive so deep into the earth thereupon the young giant unharnessed the horses and began to draw the plough himself first saying now father get you home and tell mother to cook a hearty meal while i just run round the field and in a very short time he had done what the peasant would have taken two whole days to do when all was finished he laid plough horse and harrow over his shoulders and carried them home as easily as though they were a truss of hay when he reached the house he saw his mother sitting on a bench in the courtyard oh 
who is this frightful monster of a man she cried that is our son said her husband i cannot believe that replied the woman for our child was a tiny little thing and she begged the young giant to go away however he did not take any notice of what she said for after feeding the horse in the stable he came into the kitchen and sat himself down upon the edge of the dresser mother mother he said i'm so hungry give me my dinner here it is said his mother and set two enormous dishes of smoking stew upon the table it would have been enough to last the husbandman and his wife for eight whole days but the giant ate it all up in five minutes and then asked if they could give him more but the woman shook her head and said they had no more in the house mother he said i am fainting with hunger that was a mere bite the woman was so frightened at this she ran and made some more stew in the largest fish kettle ah sighed the young giant this is something like a meal but when he had finished he still felt hungry and said well father i can see i shall starve if i come here to live i will go and seek my fortune in the wide world if you can procure me a bar of iron so strong that i cannot break it across my knee the peasant quickly harnessed his two horses to the wagon and from the smithy in the village he fetched an iron bar so heavy that the horses could hardly drag it this the giant tried across his knee snap it cracked in half like a twig then the peasant took his wagon and four horses to the smithy and brought back as heavy a bar as they could carry but in a second the giant had broken it into two pieces and tossed them each aside father he said i need a stronger one yet take the wagon and eight horses to the smithy and fetch me back as heavy a one as they can draw this the countryman did and again the youth broke it in two as easily as if he had cracked a nut well father i see you cannot get me anything strong enough i must go and try my fortune without it so he turned blacksmith and journeyed for many miles until he came to a village where dwelt a very grasping smith who earned a great deal of money but who gave not a penny of it away the giant stepped into his forge and asked if by any chance he were in want of help what wages do you ask said the smith looking the young man up and down for thought he here is a fine powerful fellow who surely will be worth his salt i don't want money replied the giant but here's a bargain for every fortnight when you give your workmen their wages i will give you two strokes across your shoulders it will be just a little amusement for me the cunning smith agreed very willingly for he thought in this way he would save a great deal of money however next morning when the new journeyman started work with the very first stroke he gave the red heart iron it shivered into a thousand pieces and the anvil buried itself so deep in the earth that he could not pull it out again here fellow cried his master you won't suit me you are far too clumsy i must put an end to our bargain just as you please said the other but you must pay me for the work i have done so i will just give you one little tap on the shoulder with that he gave the greedy smith such a blow that it knocked him flying over four hay ricks then picking up the stoutest iron bar he could find for a walking stick he set forth once more on his travels presently he came to a farmhouse where he inquired if they were in need of a bailiff now the farmer just happened to need a head man so he was engaged at once upon the same terms as he had arranged with the old blacksmith 
next morning the farm servants were to go and fell trees in the wood but just as they were ready to start they found the new bailiff was still in bed and fast asleep they shook him and shouted at him but he would not open his eyes he only grumbled at them and told them to be gone i shall have done my work and reached home long before you he said so he stayed in bed for another two hours then arose and after eating a hearty breakfast he started with his cart and horses for the wood there was a narrow pathway through which he had to pass just before entering the wood and after he had led his horses through this he went back and built up a barrier of brambles and firs and branches so thick that no horse could possibly force its way through then he drove on and met his fellow servants just leaving the wood on their way home drive on my friends he said and i will be home before you even know then he pulled up a giant elm by its roots just on the border of the woods and laying it on his cart he turned and quickly overtook the others there they were staring helplessly at the great barricade which barred their path just as he had expected to find them ha ha he chuckled you might just as well have slept an hour or two longer for i told you you would not get home before me then shouldering the tree the horse and the cart he pushed away through the barrier as easily as if he had been carrying a bag of feathers when he got back to the farm he showed his new work walking stick as he called the tree to his master wife said the farmer we have indeed found a capital bailiff and if he does need more sleep than the others he works much better so the months rolled by until a whole year had come and gone and the time had arrived to pay the servants their wages but the farmer was overcome with fright when he remembered the blows the giant had to give him so he begged him to change his mind and accept the whole farm and lands instead no said the giant i am a bailiff and a bailiff i intend to remain so you must pay me the wages we agreed upon the farmer now obtained a promise that he would give him a fortnight to think the matter over and he secretly assembled all his friends and neighbors to discuss what he should do the only thing they could suggest was to slay the bailiff and it was arranged that he should be told to bring a cartload of millstones to the edge of the well and then the farmer was to send him down to the bottom to clean it out when the giant was safely at the bottom all the friends and neighbors would come and roll the millstones down upon him everything happened as had been planned and when the bailiff was at the bottom of the well the millstones were rolled in as each one fell the water splashed over the top in a great wave it seemed impossible that the bailiff should not be crushed to death but suddenly the neighbors heard him call out i say you up there shoo away the chickens they are scattering the gravel in my eyes then he quickly finished his task and presently jumped out of the well with one of the millstones hanging round his neck have not i got a handsome collar he said again the farmer was overcome with fear and again he called together all his friends and relations the only thing they could think of was to advise the farmer to send the bailiff to the haunted mill by night and order him to grind eight bushels of corn for they said they no man has spent the night there has ever come out alive so the bailiff went and fetched the corn from the loft he put two bushels in his right hand pocket and two in his left and the rest he carried in a sack across his shoulders when he reached the mill the miller told him it was haunted and he had best come to grind his corn in the daytime if he did not wish to lose his life tush tush said the giant 
make haste and leave me alone come back in the morning and i promise you will find me all safe and sound then he entered the mill and emptied his sacks into the hopper and by twelve o'clock he had finished his work feeling a little weary he sat down to rest but noticed with great interest the door opening very slowly all by itself then a table laden with rich food and wines came and set itself before him still there was no living creature to be seen next the chairs came and placed themselves round the festive board and then he noticed fingers handling the knives and forks and placing food upon the plates the giant soon got tired of watching this and as he felt quite ready for a meal himself he drew up his chair to the table and partook of a hearty repast just as he finished he felt a breath of air blow out all the lights and then a thundering blow fell upon his head well i'm not going to put up with this he said if i feel any more taps like the one i will just tap back then a great battle raged and blows fell thickly all around but he never let himself feel any fear but only gave back as many as he could when morning came the miller hastened to the mill expecting to find the giant dead but he was greeted with a hearty laugh well miller said the giant somebody has been slapping me in the night but i guess they have had as good blows as they have given and i have managed to eat a hearty supper into the bargain the miller was overjoyed to find the evil spell had been broken and begged the giant to accept some money as reward but this he refused slinging the meal on his shoulders he went back to ask his wages from the farmer the farmer was furious to see his bailiff safe and sound again and paced his floor to and fro shivering and shaking like a leaf he felt he could not breathe so he threw the window open and before he knew what had happened the giant had sent him flying out the window straight over the hills into nowhere land and as the farmer had not waited to receive the second stroke the giant gave it to his wife and she flew out to join her husband and for aught i know they are flying through the air still end of chapter thirty nine recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter forty of tales of laughter this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by evan smith tales of laughter by nora archibald smith and kate douglas wiggin chapter forty the sweet soup once on a time there was a poor but very good little girl who lived alone with her mother and when my story begins they had nothing in the house to eat so the child went out into the forest and there she met an old woman who already knew her distress and who presented her with a pot which had the following power if one said to it boil little pot it would cook sweet soup and when one said stop little pot it would immediately cease to boil the little girl took the pot home to her mother and now their poverty and distresses were at an end for they could have sweet broth as often as they pleased one day however the little girl went out and in her absence the mother said boil little pot so it began to cook and she soon ate all she wished but when the poor woman wanted to have the pot stop she found she did not know the word away therefore the pot boiled and very quickly was over the edge and as it boiled and boiled the kitchen presently became full then the house and the next house and soon the whole street it seemed likely to satisfy all the world for though there was the greatest necessity to do so nobody knew how to stop it at last when only a very small cottage of all the village was left unfilled with soup the child returned and said at once stop little pot immediately it ceased to boil but whoever wishes to enter the village now must eat his way through the soup end of chapter forty 
Recording by Evan Smith. Chapter 41 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Seven at One Blow. A tailor sat in his workroom one morning, stitching away busily at a coat for the Lord Mayor. He whistled and sang so gaily that all the little boys who passed the shop on their way to school thought what a fine thing it was to be a tailor, and told one another when they grew to be men they'd be tailors too. "'How hungry I feel, to be sure!' cried the little man at last but i am far too busy to trouble about eating i must finish his lordship's coat before i touch a morsel of food and he broke once more into a merry song fine new jam for sale sang out an old woman as she walked along the street jam i can't resist such a treat said the tailor and running to the door he shouted this way for jam dame show me a pot of your very finest the woman handed him a jar after jar but he found fault with all at last he hit upon some to his liking and how many pounds will you take sir i'll take four ounces he replied in a solemn tone and mind you give me good weight the old woman was very angry for she had expected to sell several pounds at least and she went off grumbling after she had weighed out the four ounces now for a feed cried the little man taking a loaf from the cupboard as he spoke he cut off a huge slice and spread the jam on quite half an inch thick then he suddenly remembered his work it will never do to get jam on the lord mayor's coat so i'll finish it off before i even take one bite said he so he picked up his work once more and his needle flew in and out like lightning i'm afraid the lord mayor had some stitches in his garment that were quite a quarter of an inch long the tailor glanced longingly at his slice of bread and jam once or twice but when he looked the third time it was quite covered with flies and a fine feast they were having off it this was too much for the little fellow up he jumped crying so you think i provide bread and jam for you indeed well very soon see take that and he struck the fly such a heavy blow with a duster that no fewer than seven lay dead upon the table while the others flew up to the ceiling in great haste seven at one blow said the little man with great pride such a brave deed ought to be known all over town and it won't be my fault if folks fail to hear of it so he cut out a wide belt and stitched on it in big golden letters the words seven at one blow when this was done he fastened it round him crying i'm cut out for something better than a tailor it is quite clear i'm one of the world's great heroes and i'll be off at once to seek my fortune he glanced round the cottage but there was nothing of value to take with him the only thing he possessed in the world was a small cheese you may as well come too said he stowing away the cheese in his pocket and now i'm off when he got into the street the neighbors all crowded round him to read the words on his belt seven at one blow said they to another what a blessing he's going for it wouldn't be safe to have a man about us who could kill seven of us at one stroke you see they didn't know that the tailor had only killed flies they took it to mean men he jogged along for some miles until he came to a hedge 
where a little bird was caught in the branches come along said the tailor i'll have you to keep my cheese company so he caught the bird and put it carefully in his pocket with the cheese soon he reached a lofty mountain and he made up his mind to climb it and see what was going on at the other side when he reached the top there stood a huge giant glazing down at into the valley below good day said the tailor the giant turned round seeing nobody but the little tailor there he cried with scorn and what might you be doing here might i ask you'd best be off at once not so fast my friend said the little man read this seven at one blow read the giant and he began to wish he'd been more civil well i'm sure nobody would think it to look at you he replied but since you are so clever do this and he picked up a stone and squeezed it until water ran out do that why it's mere child's play to me and the man took out his cheese and squeezed it until the whey ran from it now who is cleverer asked the tailor you see i can squeeze milk out while you only get water the giant was too surprised to utter a word for a few minutes then taking up another stone he threw it so high into the air that for a moment they couldn't see where it went then down it fell to the ground again good said the tailor but i'll throw a stone that won't come back again at all taking the little bird from his pocket he threw it into the air and the bird glad to get away flew right off and never returned this sort of thing didn't suit the giant at all for he wasn't used to being beaten by anyone here's something y you'll never manage said he to the little man just come and help me carry this fallen oak tree for a few miles delighted said the tailor and i'll take the end with the branches for it's sure to be heavier agreed replied the giant and he lifted the heavy trunk on his shoulder while the tailor climbed up among the branches at the other end and sang with all his might as though carrying a tree was nothing to him the poor giant who was holding the tree trunk and the little tailor as well soon grew tired i'm going to let it fall he shouted and the tailor jumped down from the branches and pretended he had been helping all the time the idea of a man your size finding a tree too heavy to carry laughed the little tailor you are clever little fellow and no mistake replied the giant and if you'll only come and spend the night in our cave we shall be delighted to have you i shall have great pleasure in coming my friend answered the little tailor and together they set off for the giant's home there were seven more giants in the cave and each one of them was eating roasted pig for his supper they gave the little man some food and then showed him a bed in which he might pass the night it was so big that after tossing about for half an hour in it the tailor thought he would be more comfortable if he slept in the corner so he crept out without being noticed in the middle of the night the giant stole out of bed and went up to the one where he thought the little man was fast asleep taking a big bar of iron he struck such a heavy blow at it that he woke up all the other giants keep quiet friends said he i've just killed the little scamp the tailor made his escape as soon as possible and he journeyed on for many miles until he began to feel very tired so he lay down under a tree and was soon fast asleep when he awoke he found a big crowd of people standing round him up walked one very wise-looking old man who was really the king's prime minister is it true that you have killed seven at one blow he asked it is a fact answered the little tailor 
Then come with me to the king, my friend, for he's been searching for a brave man like you for some time past. You are to be made captain of his army, and the king will give you a fine house to live in. That I will, replied the little man. It is just the sort of thing that will suit me, and I'll come at once. He hadn't been in the king's service long before everyone grew jealous of him. The soldiers were afraid that, if they offended him, he would make short work of them all, while the members of the king's household didn't fancy the idea of making such a fuss over a stranger. So the soldiers went in a body to the king and asked that another captain should be put over them, for they were afraid of this one. The king didn't like to refuse, for fear they should all desert, and yet he didn't dare get rid of the captain, in case such a strong and brave man should try to have his revenge. At last the king hit upon a plan. In some woods close by there lived two giants, who were the terror of the countryside. They robbed all the travelers, and if any resistance was offered, they killed the men on the spot. Sending for the little tailor, he said, Knowing you to be the bravest man in my kingdom, I want to ask a favor of you. If you will kill these two giants and bring me back proof that they are dead, you shall marry the princess, my daughter, and have half my kingdom. You shall also take one hundred men to help you, and you are to set off at once. A hundred men, your majesty? Pray, what do I want with hundred men? If I can kill seven at one blow, I needn't be afraid of two. I'll kill them fast enough, never fear. The tailor chose ten strong men, and told them to await him on the border of the wood, while he went on quite alone. He could hear the giants snoring for quite half an hour before he reached them, so he knew in which direction to go. He found the pair fast asleep under a tree, so he filled his pockets with stones and climbed up into the branches over their heads. Then he began to pelt one of the giants with the missiles, until after a few minutes one of the men awoke. Giving the other a rough push, he cried, If you strike me like that again, I'll know the reason why. I didn't touch you, said the other giant crossly, and they were soon fast asleep once more. Then the tailor threw stones at the other man, and soon he awoke as the first had done. What did you throw that at me for? said he. You are dreaming, answered the other. I didn't throw anything. No sooner were they fast asleep again than the little man began to pelt them afresh. Up they both sprang, and seizing each other, they began to fight in real earnest. Not content with their fists, they tore up huge trees by their roots and beat each other until very soon the pair lay dead on the ground. Down climbed the little tailor, and taking his sword in his hand, he plunged it into each giant, and then went back to the edge of the forest where the ten men were waiting for him. They are as dead as two doornells, shouted the little man. I don't say that I had an easy task, for they tore up trees by their roots to try to protect themselves with, but, of course, it was good. What were two giants to a man who has slain seven at one blow? But the men wouldn't believe it until they went into the forest and saw the two dead bodies, lying each in a pool of blood, while the ground was covered with uprooted trees. Back they went to the king, but instead of handing over half his kingdom, as he had promised, his majesty told the little tailor that there was still another brave deed for him to do before he got the princess for his bride. Just name it, then. I'm more than ready, was the man's reply. You are to kill the famous unicorn 
that is running wild in the forest and doing so much damage when this is done you shall have your reward at once no trouble at all your majesty i'll get rid of him in a twinkling he made the ten men wait for him at the entrance of the wood as they had done the first time and taking a stout rope and a saw he entered the forest alone up came the unicorn but just as it was about to rush at the man he darted behind a big tree the unicorn dashed with such force against the tree that its horn was caught quite fast and it was kept a prisoner taking his rope he tied it tightly round the animal and after sawing off the horn back he went to the palace leading the unicorn by his side but even then the king was not satisfied and he made the little tailor catch a wild boar that had been seen wandering in the woods he took a party of huntsmen with him but again he made them wait on the outskirts of the forest while he went on by himself the wild boar made a dash at the little tailor but the man was too quick for it he slipped into a little building close by with the animal at his heels then catching sight of a small window he forced his way out into the forest again and while the boar who was too big and clumsy to follow stood gazing at the spot where he had disappeared the tailor ran round and closed the door keeping the animal quite secure inside then he called the hunters who shot the boar and carried the body back to the palace this time the king was obliged to keep his promise so the little tailor became a prince and a grand wedding they had too when they had be been married for about a couple of years the princess once overheard her husband talking in his sleep boy if you have to put a patch on that waistcoat take the lord mayor's coat home at once or i'll box your ears he said oh dear cried the princess to think that i've married a common tailor whatever can i do to get rid of him so she told her father the story and the king said she need not worry for he would find a way out of the difficulty she was to leave the door open that night and while the tailor was sleeping the king's servants should steal into the room bind the tailor and take him away to be killed the princess promised to see that everything was in readiness and she tripped about all day with a very light heart she little knew that one of the tailor's servants had overheard their cruel plot and carried the news straight to his master that night when the princess thought her husband was sleeping fast she crept to the door and opened it to her great terror the tailor began to speak boy take the lord mayor's coat home or i'll box your ears haven't i killed seven at one blow haven't i slain two giants a unicorn and a wild boar what do i care for the men who are standing outside my door at this moment and these words off flew the men as though they had been shot from a gun and no more attempts were ever made on his life so the princess had to make the best of a bad job he lived on and when the old king died he ascended the throne in his stead so the brave little tailor became ruler over the whole kingdom and his motto throughout his whole life was seven at one blow end of chapter 41 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter 42 of tales of laughter this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith, 
and Kate Douglas Wiggin. The Cat and the Mouse in Partnership A cat, having made the acquaintance of a mouse, told her so much of the great love and affection that he had for her, that the mouse at last consented to live in the same house with him, and to have their domestic affairs in common. But we must provide for the winter, said the cat, or we shall be starved. You, little mouse, cannot go everywhere looking for food, or you will meet with an accident. This advice was followed, and a pot was brought with some grease in it. However, when they had got it, they could not imagine where it should be put. But at last, after a long consideration, the cat said, I know no better a place to put it than in the church, for there is no one dares to steal anything. We will set it beneath the organ, and not touch it till we really want it. So the pot was put away in safety, but not long afterward the cat began to wish for it again. So he spoke to the mouse and said, I have to tell you that I am asked by my aunt to stand godfather to a little son, white with brown marks, whom she has just brought into the world, and so I must go to the christening. Let me go out to-day, and do you stop at home and keep house? Certainly, answered the mouse, pray go, and if you eat anything nice, think of me. I would also willingly drink a little of the sweet red christening wine. But alas, it was all a story, for the cat had no aunt, and had not been asked to stand godfather to any one. He went straight to the church, crept up to the grease pot, and licked it till he had eaten off the top. Then he took a walk on the roofs of the houses in the town, thinking over his situation and now and then stretching himself in the sun and stroking his whiskers as often as he thought of his meal. When it was evening he went home again, and the mouse said, So you have come at last. What a charming day you must have had. Yes, answered the cat. It went off very well. What have you named the kitten? asked the mouse. Top off, said the cat very quickly. Top off? replied the mouse. That is a curious and remarkable name. Is it common in your family? What does that matter? said the cat. It is not worse than crumb-stealer, as your children are called. Not long afterward the cat felt the same longing as before, and said to the mouse, You must oblige me by taking care of the house once more by yourself. I am again asked to stand godfather, and since the youngster has a white ring round his neck, I cannot get off the invitation. So the good little mouse consented, and the cat crept away behind the wall to the church again, and ate half the contents of the grease pot. Nothing tastes better than what one eats by oneself, said he, quite contented with his day's work and when he came home the mouse asked how this child was named. "'Half out,' answered the cat. "'Half out? What do you mean? I never heard such a name before in my life. I will wager anything it is not in the calendar.' But the cat replied nothing. Pussy's mouth soon began to water again at the recollection of the feasting. "'All good things come in threes,' said he to the mouse. I am again required to be godfather. This child is quite black, and he has little white claws, but not a single white hair on his body. Such a thing only happens once in two years, so pray excuse me this time. Top off, half out, answered the mouse. Those are such curious names, they make me a bit suspicious. Ah, replied the cat. There you sit in your grey coat and long tail, thinking nonsense. That comes of never going out. The mouse buried herself during the cat's absence, in putting the house in order, but meanwhile greedily puss licked the grease-pot clean out. 
when it is all done one will rest in peace thought he to himself and as soon as night came he went home fat and tired the mouse however again asked what the name of the third child had received it will not please you any better answered the cat for he is called all out all out exclaimed the mouse well that is certainly the most curious name by far i have never seen it in print all out what can that mean and shaking her head she rolled herself up and went to sleep after that nobody else asked the cat to stand godfather but the winter had arrived and nothing more was to be picked up out of doors so the mouse bethought herself of the store of provision and said come friend cat we will go to our grease pot which we laid by it will taste well now yes indeed replied the cat it will taste as well as if you stroked your tongue against the window so they set out on their journey and when they arrived at the church the pot stood in its old place but it was empty ah said the mouse i see what has happened now i know you are indeed a faithful friend you have eaten the whole as you stood godfather first top off then half out then will you be quiet cried the cat not a word or i'll eat you but the poor mouse had all out at her tongue's end and had scarcely uttered it when the cat made a spring seized her in his mouth and swallowed her this happens every day in the world end of chapter forty two recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter forty three of tales of laughter this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c tales of laughter by nora archibald smith and kate douglas wiggin old sultan a certain peasant had a trusty dog called sultan who had grown quite old in his service and had lost all his teeth so that he could not hold anything fast one day the peasant stood with his wife at the house door and said this morning i shall shoot old sultan for he is no longer of any use his wife however compassionating the poor animal replied well since he has served us so long and so faithfully i think we may very well afford him food for the rest of his life a eh, what replied her husband you are not very clever he has not a tooth in his head and never a thief is afraid of him so he must trot off if he has served us he has also received his dinner every day the poor dog lying stretched out in the sun not far from his master heard all he said and was much troubled at learning the morrow would be his last day he had one good friend the wolf in the forest to whom he slipped at evening and complained of the sad fate which awaited him be of good courage my father said the wolf i will help you out of your trouble i have just thought of something early to-morrow morning your master goes haymaking with his wife and they will take with them their child because no one will be left in the house and while they are at work they will put him behind the hedge in the shade and set you by to watch him i will then spring out of the wood and steal away the child and you must run after me hotly as if you were pursuing me i will let it fall and you shall take it back to its parents who will then believe you have saved it and they will be too thankful to do you any injury and so you will come into great favor and they will never let you want again this plan pleased the dog 
and it was carried out exactly as proposed the father cried out when he saw the wolf running off with the child but as old sultan brought it back he was highly pleased and stroked him and said not a hair on your head shall be touched you shall eat your meals in comfort to the end of your days he then told his wife to go home and cook old sultan some bread and broth which would not need biting and also to bring the pillow out of his bed that he might give it to him for a resting place henceforth old sultan had as much as he could wish for himself and soon afterward the wolf visited him and congratulated him on his prosperous circumstances but my father said he slyly you will close your eyes if i by accident steal away a fat sheep from your master reckon not on that replied the dog my master believes me faithful i dare not give you what you ask the wolf however thought he was not in earnest and by night came slinking into the yard to fetch away the sheep but the peasant to whom the dog had communicated the design of the wolf caught him and gave him a sound thrashing with the flail the wolf was obliged to scamper off but he cried out to the dog wait a bit you rascal you shall pay for this the next morning the wolf sent the boar to challenge the dog that they might settle their affair in the forest old sultan however could find no other second than a cat who had only three legs and as they went out together the poor cat limped along holding her tail high in the air from pain the wolf and his second were already on the spot selected but as they saw their opponent coming they thought he was bringing a great sabre with him because they saw in front the erect tail of the cat and whenever the poor animal hopped on its three legs they thought nothing else than he was going to take up a great stone to throw at him both of them thereupon became very nervous and the boar crept into a heap of dead leaves and the wolf climbed up a tree as soon as the dog and cat arrived on the spot they wondered what had become of their adversary the wild boar however had not quite concealed himself for the tips of his ears were sticking out and while the cat was considering them attentively the boar twitched one of them and the cat took it for a mouse and making a spring gave it a good bite at this the boar shook himself with a great cry and ran away calling out there sits the guilty one up in the tree the dog and the cat looked up and saw the wolf who was ashamed at himself for being so fearful and begging the dog's pardon entered into treaty with him end of chapter forty three recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c Chapter forty four of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter forty four The Nail. A tradesman had once transacted a good day's business at a fair, disposed of all his goods and filled his purse with gold and silver. He prepared afterward to return, in order to reach home by evening, so he strapped his portmanteau with the money in it upon his horse's back, and rode off. At noon he baited in a small town, and as he was about to set out again, the stable-boy who brought his horse said to him, Sir, a nail is wanted in the shoe on the left-hand foot of your animal. Let it be wanting, replied the tradesman. I am in a hurry and the iron will doubtless hold the six hours I have yet to travel. Late in the afternoon he had to dismount again and feed his horse, and at this place also the boy came and told him that a nail was wanting in one of the shoes, and asked him whether he should take the horse to a farrier. No, no, let it be, replied the master. 
it will last out the couple of hours i have now to travel i am in haste so saying he rode off but his horse soon began to limp and from limping it came to stumbling and presently the beast fell down and broke its leg thereupon the tradesman had to leave his unfortunate horse lying on the road to unbuckle the portmanteau and to walk home with it upon his shoulder where he arrived at last late at night all this misfortune he said to himself is owing to the want of a nail more haste the less speed end of chapter forty four the nail chapter forty five of tales of laughter this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 45. The Fox and the Horse. There was once a farmer who had a horse which had served him faithfully until he was too old to work any longer. And then his master would not give him anything to eat, but said, I cannot really find any use for you now but still I mean you well, and so, if you will show yourself strong enough to bring home a lion, I will requite you. But now you must make yourself scarce in this stable. So saying, the farmer drove the poor horse out, and he went with drooping head toward the forest to shelter himself from the weather. In among the trees he met a fox, who asked him why he looked so careworn and walked so downcast. Alas, said the horse, Avarice and fidelity dwell not in the same house together. My master has forgotten all the services which I have rendered him for so many years, and because I am unable now to work any longer, he will not give me any fodder, but has driven me out of the stable. Without any hope, inquired the fox. Hope is slight enough, replied the horse. He said that if I could manage to bring him back a lion, he would receive me, but he knows well I cannot do that. Then I will help you, replied the fox. Now lie down and stretch yourself out, and do not stir, so that you may appear dead. The horse, accordingly, did as he was bid, and the fox went to the lion, whose den was not far off, and said to him, Near here lies a dead horse. Come with me, and you may make a capital meal. The lion accompanied the fox, and when they came to the horse, the fox said, Hist! Listen to what I am about to say. You can have this beast at your convenience. I will bind it to you by the tail, and you shall then drag it away to your den, and devour it at your leisure. This advice pleased the lion, and in order that the fox might knot the horse's tail fast to him, he stood with his back toward it, quite still. The fox, however, cunningly tied the lion's legs together with the hairs of the horse's tail, and pulled and knotted all so carefully that no strength could have divided it. As soon as his work was finished, the fox tapped the horse on the shoulder and cried, Drag, my friend, drag! The horse jumped up at once and drew the lion away with him. The beast soon began to roar, so that all the birds in the forest flew away in terror. But the horse let him roar while he dragged him to his master's door. Now, when the farmer saw this proof of fidelity of his horse, he thought better of his former resolution, and said to the faithful animal, you shall remain with me now and live at your ease and so the good horse had good meals and good treatment until he died end of chapter forty five the fox and the horse chapter forty six of tales of laughter this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by lindemary nielsen vancouver b c tales of laughter by nora archibald smith and kate douglas wiggin the giant and the tailor a certain tailor who was a large boaster but a very small performer took it once into his head to go and look about him in the world as soon as he could he left his workshop and travelled away over hills and valleys now on this road 
and now on that but still onward after he had gone some way he perceived in the distance a steep mountain and behind it a lofty tower which rose from the midst of a wild dense forest good gracious cried the tailor what is this and driven by his curiosity he went rapidly toward the place but he opened his mouth and eyes wide enough when he got nearer for the tower had legs and sprang in a trice over the steep hill and stood up a mighty giant before the tailor what are you about here you punny fly legs asked the giant in a voice which rumbled on all sides like thunder i am trying to earn a piece of bread in this forest whispered the tailor well then it is time you entered my service said the giant fiercely if it must be so why not said the tailor humbly but what wage shall i have what wage shall you have repeated the giant contemptuously listen and i will tell you every year three hundred and sixty-five days and one besides if it be leap year is that right quite said the tailor but thought to himself one must cut according to his cloth i will seek to make myself free very soon go little rascal and fetch me a glass of water cried the giant why not the whole well and its spring too said the tailor but fetched as he was bid what the well and the spring too bellowed the giant who was rather cowardly and weak and so began to be afraid thinking to himself this fellow can do more than roast apples he has a heap of courage i must take care or he will be too much of a servant for me so when the tailor returned with the water the giant sent him to fetch a couple of bundles of faggots from the forest and bring them home why not the whole forest at one stroke every tree young and old knotty and smooth asked the tailor and went away what the whole forest and the well too and its spring murmured the frightened giant in his beard and he began to be still more afraid and believed that the tailor was too great a man for him and not fit for his servant however when the tailor returned with his load of faggots the giant told him to shoot two or three wild boars for their supper why not rather a thousand at one shot and the rest afterward cried the boaster what what gasped the cowardly giant terribly frightened oh well that is enough to-day you may go to sleep now the poor giant however was so very much afraid of the little tailor that he could not close his eyes all the night but tossed about thinking how to get rid of his servant whom he regarded as an enchanter conspiring against his life with time comes counsel the following morning the giant and the dwarf went together to a marsh where a great many willow trees were growing when they got there the giant said seat yourself on one of those willow rods tailor on my life i only wish to see if you are in a condition to bend it down the boasting tailor climbed the tree and perched himself on a bough and then holding his breath he made himself heavy enough thereby to bend the tree down soon however he had to take breath again and immediately having been unfortunate enough to come without his goose in his pocket the bough flew up and to the great joy of the giant carried the tailor with it so high into the air that he went out of sight and whether he has since fallen down again or is yet flying about in the air i am unable to tell you satisfactorily end of chapter forty six recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter forty seven of tales of laughter this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by evan smith 
Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 47 The Spider and the Flea A spider and a flea dwelt together in one house, and brewed their beer in an eggshell. One day, when the spider was stirring it up, she fell in and scalded herself. Thereupon the flea began to scream, and then the door asked, "'Why are you screaming, flea?' "'Because little spider has scalded herself in the beer-tub,' replied she. Thereupon the door began to creak as if it were in pain, and a broom which stood in the corner asked, "'What are you creaking for, door?' "'May I not creak?' it replied. The little spider scalded herself, and the flea weeps. So the broom began to sweep industriously, and presently a little cart came by and asked the reason. "'May I not sweep?' replied the broom. The little spider scalded herself, and the flea weeps. The little door creaks with the pain. Thereupon the little cart said, "'So will I run,' and began to run very fast past a heap of ashes, which cried out, "'Why do you run, little cart?' "'Because,' replied the cart, "'the little spider scalded herself, and the flea weeps, "'the little door creaks with the pain, and the broom sweeps. "'Then,' said the ashes, "'I will burn furiously. "'Now, next the ashes, there grew a tree, which asked, "'Little heap, why do you burn?' "'Because,' was the reply, "'the little spider scalded herself, and the flea weeps, "'the little door creaks with the pain, and the broom sweeps. "'The little cart runs on so fast.' Thereupon the tree cried, I will shake myself, and went on shaking till all its leaves fell off. A little girl passing by with a water pitcher saw it shaking and asked, Why do you shake yourself, little tree? Why may I not, said the tree. The little spider scalded herself, and the flea weeps. The little door creaks with the pain, and the broom sweeps. The little cart runs on so fast, and the ashes burn. Then the maiden said, If so, I will break my pitcher and she threw it down and broke it. At this the streamlet from which she drew the water asked, Why do you break your pitcher, my little girl? Why may I not, she replied, for the little spider scalded herself, and the flea weeps, the little door creaks with the pain, and the broom sweeps, the little cart runs on so fast, and the ashes burn, the little tree shakes down its leaves, now it's my turn. Ah, then, said the streamlet, now must I begin to flow and it flowed and flowed along in a great stream which kept getting bigger and bigger until at last it swallowed up the little girl the little tree the ashes the cart the broom the door the flea and last of all the spider all together end of chapter 47 recording by evan smith chapter 48 of tales of laughter this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Evan Smith. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 48. The Little Shepherd Boy. Once upon a time there was a little shepherd boy who was famed far and wide for the wise answers which he gave to all questions. Now the king of the country heard of this lad, but he would not believe what was said about him, so the boy was ordered to come to court. When he arrived, the king said to him, If you can give me answers to each of the three questions which I will now put to you, I will bring you up as my own child, and you shall live here with me in my palace. What are these three questions? asked the boy. The first is, How many drops of water are there in the sea? My lord king, replied the shepherd boy, let all the waters be stopped up on the earth, so that not one drop shall run into the sea before I count it, and then I will tell you how many drops there are in the sea. The second question, said the king, is, how many stars are there in the sky? Give me a large sheet of paper, said the boy, and then he made in it with a pin so many minute holes that they were far too numerous to see or to count, and dazzled the eyes of whomsoever looked at them. This done, he said, so many stars are there in the sky as there are holes in this paper. Now count them. But nobody was able. Thereupon the king said, the third question is, how many seconds are there in eternity? In Lower Pomerania is situate the Adamantine Mountain, one mile in height, one mile in breadth, and one mile deep. And thither comes a bird once in every thousand years, which rubs its beak against the hill, 
and when the whole shall be rubbed away, then will the first second of eternity be gone by. You have answered the three questions like a sage, said the king, and from henceforward you shall live with me in my palace, and I will treat you as my own child. End of chapter 48 Recording by Evan Smith Chapter number 49 of Tales of Laughter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Estelle Evans, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wigan. Chapter 49. The Seven Swabians. There were once seven Swabians in company, the first of whom was named Schultz, the second Jackie, the third Marley, the fourth Durgley, the fifth Michael, the sixth Hans, and the seventh Veedley, and they were all travelling in search of adventures, and for the performance of mighty deeds. In order that they might not be without protection, they thought fit to carry along with them a very long and strong pole. Upon this they all seven held, and in the front the boldest and most courageous man, who was Schultz, walked, while the others followed behind, and Veetley was last. One day in July, after they had travelled some distance, and had nearly entered the village, where they intended to pass the night, it happened that just as they came to a large meadow, a hornet or dragon fly flew out from behind a bush and hummed about the travellers in a warlike manner. Schultz was frightened and almost let go of the pole, and the perspiration stood all over his body from terror. "'Listen, listen!' he cried to his companions. "'I hear trumpeting!' Jackie, who was last but one in the row, and had got I know not what into his nose, exclaimed, "'Something certainly is at hand. I can smell brimstone and powder!' At these words Schultz sprang over a hedge, and in a thrice, in his haste to escape, and happening to alight on the prongs of a rake, which was left in the field by the haymakers, the handle sprung up and gave him an awkward blow on the forehead. "'Oh, oh, oh, woe is me!' cried Schultz. "'Take me prisoner, and I will give myself up. I surrender.' The six others thereupon jumped over the hedge, too, and cried likewise, "'We surrender if you surrender! We surrender if you surrender!' At length, when they found no en enemy came to bind and take them away, they saw they were deceived, and in order that the tale may not be told among the villagers, and they get laughed at and mocked, they took an oath among themselves never to say anything about it, unless any one of them should open his mouth unawares. After this adventure they went further, and the second danger they met must not be compared with the first for after several days had elapsed, their road chanced to lead them through an unploughed field, where a hare was lying prone in the sun, with his ears pricked up to catch every sound, and his large, glossy eyes wide open. The seven Swabians were terribly frightened at the sight of this frightful, ferocious animal, and they took counsel together what would be the least dangerous plan to adopt, for if they fled away, it was to be feared that the monster would pursue them and cut them to pieces. So they resolved to stand and have a great battle, for, said they, bravely dared is half won. All seven, therefore, grasped hold of their spear, Schultz being among the foremost and Veetley hindmost. But Schultz wanted to have his spear for himself, whereupon Veetley flew into a passion and broke away the rest advanced together upon the dragon. But first Schultz crossed himself devoutly, and invoked the assistance of heaven. Then he marched on, but as he approached the enemy he felt fearful, and cried in a great terror, Han! Herlehul! Han! Hollahel! Thus awoke the hare, who sprang away quite frightened, and when Schultz saw it flee, he jumped for joy and shouted, Zounds, friends, what fools we are! The frightful beast is but a hare. After they had recovered from their fright, the seven Swabians sought new adventures, and by and by they arrived at the river Moselle, 
a smooth and deep water, over which there were not many bridges, so that one must cross in boats to the other side. The seven Swabians, however, were ignorant of this, and they therefore shouted to a man who was working on the other side of the river, and asked him how they were to pass over. But the man did not understand what they said, on account of the distance, and his ignorance of the language. So he asked in his dialect, What? What? With this Schultz imagined the man said, Wade, wade through the stream, and being foremost on the bank he jumped into the river and began to walk across. Soon he got out of his depths and sank in the deep driving current, but his hat was carried by the wind to the opposite shore. As it reached there a frog perched himself on it and croaked, What? 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 This noise the six other Swabians, who had then reached the bank, heard, and they said to one another, Listen, does not Schultz call us? Well, if he could wade across, we can also. With these words each one jumped into the river, but they also all sank, and so it happened that the frog caused the death of six Swabians, for nobody has heard or seen of them ever since. End of chapter 49 The Seven Swabians Chapter 50 of Tales of Laughter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Tales of Laughter by Laura Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wigan. The Shreds Once upon a time there was a maiden who was very pretty, but lazy and careless. When she used to spin, she was so impatient that, if there chanced to be a little knot in the thread, she snapped off a long bit with it and threw the pieces down on the ground near her. Now she had a servant girl, who was industrious, and used to gather together the shreds of thread, clean them and weave them, till she made herself a dress with them. A certain young man had fallen in love with this lazy maiden, and their wedding day was appointed. On the evening before, the industrious servant girl kept dancing about in her fine dress, till the bride exclaimed, Ah! how the girl does jump about dressed in my shreds and leavings when the bridegroom heard this he asked the bride what she meant and she told him that the maid had worked herself a dress with the shreds of thread which she had thrown away as soon as the bridegroom heard this and saw the difference between the laziness of his intended and the industry of her servant he gave up the mistress and chose the maid for his wife. End of chapter 50 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C.